guys. So I'm going to uh, describe a figure, list the causes and consequences of sleep apnea, and recount the risk factors based on the physiology. So you've seen this before. The apneas during sleep are defined in this cartoonish way. And uh, airflow is absent, rib cage abdominal motion, oxygen saturation. And uh, I think the major things is the break in apnea, the brain has to briefly wake up, at least the brain stem has to briefly wake up. And most common is airflow obstruction at the level of the pharynx occurring during sleep. And it's associated with repetitive events and we call these mild, moderate, and severe, although I don't know what 60 is. Maybe you've heard me say that before. You know, 60, 80 apneas, is that uber severe or something like that? So, so this is the first Stroll et al. 1978, figure one. And so I want to have somebody describe this slide. Um, I'll start Dr. Stroll. So depending, uh, so, so the first parameter is um, oxygen, looks like oxygen saturation. And whenever there's a decrease and um, with the increase in EMG amplitude, there's an arousal and the rib cage, uh, like the chest and abdomen movement there's not any and during the arousal we see a movement same goes for the airflow and um, airflow through the mouth and nose so it looks like um, rib cage not moving abdomen not moving nose not moving so this is a central apnea with an arousal Okay. There's the EKG down at the bottom too. So there's some, t looks like some tachyarrhythmia when the arousal happens. Okay, anybody else see anything else in here? Are three events, are all three the same? Um, uh, Dr. Shroll, the second and third events, it looks like a mixed apnea because uh, there is abdominal movement, there is rib cage movement um, at the end of the event in second and third, and also first. Well, if you look at your third one, you have some abdominal movement at the end, the last three breaths. That looks pretty close to the last three breaths of the first one. Right. What else is happening at the rib cage? Let's go to the first one again. So you start off by, it looks like the end of a breath, right? Or the beginning of an app. There's no airflow at the nose. There's no airflow at the mouth initially. And you don't have anything happening. You do have a sort of a descending line on both ribcage abdominal motion. Now, you don't see that in your PSGs today, but that's because this was a linear displacement AP dimension. Okay. So what you're seeing is that uh, the start of the apnea started with probably a prolonged expiration and continued with a reduction in FRC until there was some resumption of efforts. And you can see those happening first in the genioglossal EMG with a burst of genioglossal EMG activity. 
but you start seeing these interesting little movements that at the end, the last three, what's happening, which way are they going? Looks kind of paradoxical, so it looks like they're happening in opposite directions. Yeah, so what does paradoxical mean? What do you mean by that? That the, the direction is, is opposite. They should be moving in the same direction up and down. And here it looks like they're, looks yeah. like the abdomen is going up and the chest wall is going in. Yeah. Okay. And then you see that there's one, two, three, four breaths in which they're moving in orthodox. Right? Right. There's a, the airflow at the mouth is interesting in that there's an expiratory puff after each obstructed inspiratory effort. There's fallen oxygen saturation as a consequence. And then if you look at the EKG, you see not only the tachycardia, but you see a bradycardia. And you see that happening in the first apnea. And then do you see it again? Or the third? Third. third one. Yeah, so what's different about the second one? Starts off similarly with a breath, and then there, but at that particular time, there's a movement very quickly. So it looks like, but you know, the reason you see it is you look at the end and you see that there's abdominal motion that's occurring. And it goes, which way does the abdomen go in the second one? Upwards. Goes inward. Which way does the rib cage go? Out. Outward. Inwards. Well, the it's equal and opposite, really. It's an obstructed apnea. There's no airflow there, so that's a completely obstructive apnea. The first one has a central component and, a, and an obstructive. But that's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, generally you think of obstructive apnea as an otherwise uh, healthy people as having a, a component that your diaphragm is stronger than your rib cage. And in these, this particular instance, your rib cage is stronger than your abdomen. So as you expand your rib cage, you have to pull in your abdomen. Remember, this was 1978. We didn't know what to expect. Now everybody kind of expects that the abdomen should go out and the rib cage should go in. And they don't realize that that doesn't have to happen. And so what's happening to heart rate? Heart rate didn't slow. So that's another unknown there. Could it be FRC? Well, FRC doesn't fall as quickly in the second one, as it tends to do in the first and third one. So then what happens in the third app? You take one breath, you take another breath, you take a third breath, and then what happens? The rib cage goes out and the abdomen goes in, so that's an obstructed breath. There's a pause with no rib cage abdominal motion. And then there's a resumption of respiratory effort in which the rib cage is getting smaller and the abdomen is getting bigger. So that's an obstructive apnea and, the, uh, and it slows heart rate and you break through. The amount of hypoxemia that people talk about with slowing the heart rate is almost the same in all three. You see a change in EMG activity here. But uh, so what's going on in this, this thing? So first of all, there's obstructive of the upper airway. There is a response in a respiratory control system to try to be able to recover. It doesn't recover until it gets to a certain level. And when it does recover, there's one, two, three, four breaths before this system then shuts down again. There's a length of this is about 20 seconds. You have a, and this recur, and this is recurrent obstructive apnea. You also have an autonomic outflow that is uh, changing throughout this. 
to the extent that the heart rate is slower at the end of an apnea and then speeds up at the, during, a high, during the hypertonic phase. And uh, to give you a spoiler alert, it's the way that the rib cage and abdomen, the way the rib cage is moving is what determines whether or not you get bradycardia. And hopefully the people will say, say what? But that's been shown. And so you have uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And at the time people were thinking about this, people were just measuring EMG activity, and that's what we measured, genioglossal direct EMG, with fine wires that were placed into the hypoglossal, into the genioglossal muscle through the floor of the mouth. And you can see that buzz is a little different during an apnea, it increases and comes back. This was really fairly intriguing. If you said, well, let's just say that this is all neural, you would say that the decrease in EMG activity uh, is really, or the changes in EMG activity are really what determines whether you breathe or not, and that the inhibition of genioglossal EMG is the cause for this. And there were all sorts of theories. If you go back in 1978 and you read the obstructive sleep apnea and you read the discussion of any of the EMG activity, people were all over the place. We were too. We thought that maybe this was a breakthrough in the inhibition of genioglossal EMG activity in the REM-like mechanism, not in REM, causing multiple obstructive apneas during non-REM sleep. Now, the reason you don't see sleep here is that the sleep was uh, being able to show it simultaneously was, uh, was pretty hard because we only had a six channel EEG and then we had these, these, uh, these, these signals. So if we step back about well, maybe about four months, somebody walked into a laboratory that we were doing respiratory control, said, let's do a sleep study. And the first question was, right, how do you do a sleep study? And all these, we had an oximeter. We had rib cage abdominal motion because we were looking at mechanical properties of the chest wall. We could get airflow at the nose and mouth by thermistors. These are thermistors and we can measure EKG. We got an EEG machine and we figured out somebody had shown, gone to a meeting and said, well, this is how you do the genioglossal EMG activity. And we uh, constructed that EMG activity and uh, I stuck it in a couple of my colleagues to see if it was working. Eventually I stuck it in my wife to see what that was doing too, but that was beside the point. And so this is really this, this if, I sent, uh, if I think of this particular, of, of when I look back at what I do, that at that time sleep apnea was rare and curious, the physiological observations here raised a number of, of issues that are still relevant today and things that I've looked at. So I've looked at uh, a variety of things. So let's go on. So let's see. So let's see. Right, here we go. Turn up all your volume. There you go. One breath. Which way is he paradoxing? Abdomen's going out. Rib cage is going in, right? Look at his mouth going up. Look at his nasal flaring. He's asleep. Does he look like he's breathing? No, he's not breathing. But his upper airway is activated. Oh, now he responds. One breath. Two breaths. Obstructed. He's not taking a breath, ladies and gentlemen. Now he starts taking a breath. And one of the big questions is whether or not you can hold your breath during wakefulness as long as this guy has an apnea during sleep. No breath, no breath, no breath, no breath, no breath. Now he takes a breath. 
Okay. But the purpose of that is to say you can you know you can measure these things, you can map these things, but you got to believe your your lion eyes. You got to figure out what's going on. That was that was made in a award that no longer available. Okay. So cause or what's the moment of truth? The moment of truth is when the apnea starts, right? Everybody gets excited about the hypo hypoxia. Everybody gets excited about the arousals. Everybody knows that that causes illness. But if I never had an apnea, I wouldn't have the illness. And Genia Glossal EMG was a major factor. So this is another recording I made later on in the 80s. But uh, shows genie glossal EMG, it shows esophageal pressure and airflow in the, ab in the absence of airflow in the presence of esophageal pressure, a negative pressure making respiratory efforts. So everybody take a deep breath in, you create a negative pressure. And the genie glossal EMG is reduced. There's flow limitation on that third breath. And then you have a effort and the genie glossal EMG is being activated after you begin your effort. So does that mean that, uh, and then you take another breath and, and it's the same esophageal pressure and then you keep going. And uh, so, but what you notice at the end is that all of a sudden the genie glossal EMG is being activated before the onset of uh, pleural pressure drop. And so there's a change in the timing as well as the amount of activity. And that particular element people haven't gotten into the into the details, but does this mean that there's a coordination between Genia glossal EMG and, and, and uh, diaphragm EMG or chest wall EMG. And it's not only in magnitude, but in coordination. And there are other examples of that around. But clearly, this is not enough EMG activity to keep the airway open. So this is the original paper by Rimmers. He measured genia glossal EMG with a guy named Ron Harper. You got the airways open. You lie people down and the EMG activity in your tongue uh, increases. And when you're asleep, it, it, it's uh, lost. Uh, we went on and did some studies to show that the EMG activity when you go from the upright to the supine posture is a, a curse, but it's a, you still, your airway still will, it doesn't restore your airway to the same size as when you're upright. You have to do something else to do that. And that there is evidence that the reflex activation in obstructive sleep apnea is, uh, is blunt. Is that clear? Pretty clear? So good, that's the original reference. That was 78. That, that, we published ours in uh, October. He published his in, uh, I think it was July. In the Journal of Applied Physiology. But we, we knew of his work and we, we, we got the idea of genie glossal EMG from John Rivers. So our critical closing pressure, we've talked about this before. Your airway is a starling resistor, the concepts of elasticity. This came out in 1989. The, it's not a, it's not a, a concept that is uh, New, it's just a mechanical concept that now is applied to the upper airway and that you have an upstream segment that's uh, like your nose and your downstream segment, which is your uh, pleural pressure and your collapsible segment is in the middle. And that collapsible segment is such that uh, if your upstream pressure is, uh, is, 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 and your P crit are such that you, your P crit, your critical closing pressure of the, of the, of the airway is such 
that if your upstream pressure is not sufficient to overcome your P crit, you will close your airway. And that's the, that, that happens on expiration in the lung. That's that equal pressure point, and that's that uh, flow limitation on expiration that everyone usually slept through in pulmonary physiology, but this is just turned on its uh, head with the breathing in rather than breathing out. It's also the same for blood flow through tissues, and it's also called the waterfall effect. So flow limitation. Flow limitation is uh, an example here. This is flow limitation with esophageal pressure, and on the right is flow and esophageal pressure. And what you see is that as with increasing negative pressure, in this, you don't get any more flow. So you flow limit. Also, some other interesting things in here. That, that loop, that is, you go up along the red dots and you come back along the other side, is, is, the, is a way of estimating the uh, elastic properties of the upper airway as well. So that's the off switch. And so there is a change in the airway elasticity that uh, is time dependent. All right. So if you are in the sleep lab and when you guys go into the sleep lab and they titrate a CPAP patient, this is what is happening. The airway is closed in, at point A where there's no flow and esophageal pressure. And then as you increase the pressure from 1, 3, 5.5, and 7, or something like that, you increase your flow. So that at, at a pressure of 8, your flow is maximal, and at a pressure of somewhere around 3, it's less, much less, and about 1, it's absent. So you can take your pencil, and you can take your piece of paper, and you can write down and estimate the critical closing pressure. And you probably can even do it during a, a CPAP titration. And the first one, uh, first one that does that on a sleep study this year, uh, will get uh, a, 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 a buy them a dinner. Not difficult. You got flow and pressure in front of you. So these are the other ways of looking at that. Gold and Schwartz. Trachea, upstream, flow limitation, occluded. This is a starling resistor. You don't have to memorize this, just know that it's a collapsible tube. Par comparison among groups I've showed. This is interesting because uh, they did a whole series of people and published it, and you find normal sores, upper airway resistance syndrome, obstructive hypopneas, obstructive apneas, and the P crit is critical causing pressure for values. You can see that with obstructive apnea, that is predominantly apneas, that it is about plus two with a standard deviation. And uh, more data we have, the more we realize that peak crit is important for everyone, but it doesn't determine the number of apneas. It just determines whether or not you're going to have an obstructive apnea. If your airway, uh, if your airflow and efforts go down and you're a normal person, your airway will not collapse. So that's a non, it will, you will have non obstructive apneas. And what's interesting here is that this is a group that Sono did when it was anesthetized and given succinylcholine to take, uh, take all muscle activity away. It's mapped on the same axis as the one on the left. So on the left, you're in non-REM sleep. On the right, you're in neuromuscular blockade and anesthetized and your moderate obstructive apnea and mild obstructive apnea. So I, I just, so look at the moderate obstructive apnea. That is, people have a lot more apnea. Is that the closing pressure is plus two. And in non-REM sleep, that is plus two. Huh. So it's about the same. 
But if you look at the normals, you find that their closing pressure is, is negative four when they're anesthetized, and there is negative 12 when they're unanesthetized. So there is some feature that is taken away by neuromuscular blockade that determines peak crit. It's not just the meat, it's not just the blood, blood, uh, blood pressure, it's not just the structures, it's not just this. There is something, some active component. Now, that's your that's your interpretation of this data, but that's uh, that's the implication. Uh, now, we talked about passive P crit and active muscles. Then, caused this move to the left, and it's uh, active and passive features. And if we go back, that amount is maybe around eight centimeters of water. That's a lot. So it takes minus four to close the airway in neuromuscular blockade, and it takes minus 12. Okay, so that was it. Okay, but it's more than one apnea, right? More than one apnea. Feedback controller breathing. So you have your controller, you have the nerves, muscles, goes to your control system. You have sensors as feedback control. It's important to think of this uh, uh, feedback control, and feedback control is pretty, these are healthy people in non REM and REM sleep. Each of these are not healthy people. These are pulmonary fellows in 1984 that slept in the laboratory having all these measurements. That is inspiratory flow, thoracic movement, abdominal movement, and tidal CO2 and saturation. And these are examples from these otherwise healthy people that slept in the lab with these instrumentation. So in on-rem sleep, your breath looks very similar from one breath to the next. And now, there are differences in healthy people now. We know that it's not as clear cut as this, but in non REM or N3 sleep, non REM stage three, stage four, or N3 sleep, it's very regular breathing. You see this, I don't know, Moshi, we saw this yesterday in that uh, thing we saw. You'll see this. And then this is a healthy person during REM sleep. So what's the first event? The first event is a reduction in flow, thoracic movement, abdominal movement, and tidal CO2 goes down because the airway is collapsed, O2 sat falls. So that's an obstructed apnea. And then breath, 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 and at the other end, uh, looks like it's more obstructive. But you have an irregular breathing pattern. And you have all this irregularity of breathing. So otherwise healthy people that don't have sleep apnea, they do this. Imagine if you had, there's a big thing now in sleep apnea in interstitial lung disease. They think that it might drive interstitial lung disease. Well, maybe if you aspirate at night because of your sleep apnea, you get interstitial lung disease. But the studies are all pointing to point of a REM predominance of, of breathing difficulties in 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 in, uh, in, in, in intrinsic lung disease. That is uh, fibrotic lung disease, and in fibrotic lung disease, you can imagine feedback control is screwed up because your lungs and your chest wall. So it may be just the the effect of of. of fairly regular systems. It's not as though they're, they have a disease. They have a epiphenomenon occurring because of their interstitial lung disease. But don't tell those guys that. They think that they've discovered sleep apnea. It's the pattern of breathing and the classification of apnea. So we did went through this and we have central, we have obstructive, we have mixed, we have a here an example which we have maybe a mixed apnea and then we have obstructive apneas. And then we have one apnea and then a period of central and then we have obstructive apnea so it's really just it's it's, it's non-obstruction periods of non-obstruction periods of obstruction
And so this is the theory from 1979 with Cherniak that uh, the, the reason you have central apnea is, is the upper airway and the diaphragm go below threshold. Well, now that may be true and is true and can be true, but the other is, is that your upper airway doesn't collapse uh, when drive falls. Whereas in Obstructive apnea is the drive to the upper airway may be reduced more, and, and there is evidence to suggest that's the case, but there's also a mechanical predisposition. So we've got breathing on either side of this, and that's why uh, you, know, you look for the number of breaths in between an apnea, and you look at the pattern. So ventilatory instability, this is a uh, by, done by Wellman. A low output is where you have your obstruction. And if you didn't have uh, an airway that obstruct, you would uh, have a central app. This is then another way of looking at it from an engineering point of view. Uh, Lynn worked uh, at, a, at a model like this. You have an apnea, you have opening, you have recovering, and you re-entry. So what is re-entry into an apnea? It's a reduction in drive. And it's, if you're vulnerable, your airway will narrow. And if it, even in a central apnea, the upper airway will narrow during the apnea and will get bigger as you recover. So from an engineering point of view, it's, it's uh, you, what do you recover to? Do you recovery? to a, a particular steady state, or do you overshoot? And there's a lot of engineering in this. So anybody has an engineering background or physics background, this is kind of gets to be interesting. And we try to make it that if you have cardiac arrhythmia, that sleep apnea are ventilatory arrhythmia. How about that, guys? That was in 1998 to 2002, we tried to scare people, because people were not scared of sleep apnea. They, they were snoring. Happened during sleep. You know, what difference could it make? We got more important disease called heart failure. We got more important disease called this, that, or the other. What if we call it hypoxia reoxygenation syndrome? We tried that for a while. And, and then we tried ventilatory arrhythmia. And then it mapped on to things like, well, maybe that's serious. So never really caught on. So we talk about all these things here. And so now people focused on consequences. Now, the consequences of the hypoxemia and the arousal and also the blood pressure changes and the intrathoracic uh, pressure changes. Now consequences are pretty nice to focus on because they're measurable. You can count them. You can tell them how severe they are you can be able to kind of say, this is what the illness is. And you can model this in animals. So you can model the arousals, you can model the hypoxemia, you could give them low oxygen, you could wake them up with buzzers, you could do whatever you want. And a lot of the, the basic scientists in them still do. They roll out what they call their sleep apnea animal model. And you look at it, and what they're doing is just changing ox inspired oxygen levels every 90 to, to, to 270 seconds. And then arousals, they put a buzzer in, and, they, and then they get really cute. They, they put electrodes in, so if they don't cause an EEG electrode, because you can attenuate to the sound. I mean, you don't wake up after a few days if you're living next to the subway in New York. You just get used to it. But uh, so in the animal models, they, they got smarter and they put in electrodes. And if they didn't wake up, they increased the noise or the shaking or, the, or things of that sort. There's some pretty cruel, cruel ways to make animals uh, have this model. But you can show differences in consequences. Obstructive apnea has all these various things, and they vary. This is one of the things that Magni Yunus observed. Somebody describe this. Who's going to describe this? Zach, you want to describe this? 
It's hard to see. I can tell you what the lines are. There's EOG, EOG, EEG, central, occipital, central, and then there's a. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Um, that's microvolts on something. That's EMG. That's EMG. And then you get saturation, flow, abdomen, thorax. Okay, yeah. go get go get them. I mean, so there's a few events. I mean, it looks like the, the first one, kind of towards the beginning of the um, screen, looks like a mixed apnea. You've got cessation of flow with some lack of any thorax or abdominal movement in the first half followed by some thoracic abdominal movement and then finally resumption of kind of the the breathing so it doesn't look like there's much hypoxemia related to that um and then you looks like you have a couple hypopnea so you have just decreased some severely decreased flow um followed by some oxygen desaturations um and then these, the second or the third and fourth events, you kind of have these kind of odd, it's just slowly sort of decreasing, maybe an obstructive event. So it's just decreasing flow sort of gradually to almost cessation of flow. And then this fourth event kind of similarly, gradually decreasing flow to, to zero towards the end of the event. So kind of looks like kind of some mixed apneas and some hypopneas, um, some of which lead to pretty profound desaturation and some less deep oxygen desaturation. Yeah, it's not too bad because that line starts at 95, so it goes down to 90. Okay. So that's not too much. Anybody else see, see anything there? So what do you got, Omar? Why are you why are you explain to me the beginning and the end of this uh, of this uh, e this example? Um, well, meaning before the episodes of the obstruction. So you just answered a question with a question. Yeah. Oh well. Sorry. Okay. Uh, just do, do you, what is what is your so, and, and you answered the question knowing what the answer was well before yes so at the beginning seems that the activity is pretty similar to the ending i mean the same frequency pretty much and the same synchrony as well okay uh, and same thing i think the only difference is, is probably the oxygenation seems to be um kind of recovering at the end where it was pretty stable at the beginning okay and, um, the submental chain activity is kind of is the same as well, and for the most part, I think the EEG is similar. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you that there was no change in position, there was no change in state, there was no change in anything that people could perceive. You looking at the camera. So Magna Use was the first one to sort of point out these sorts of things. You have these patients that are breathing along perfectly fine, as this gentleman is at the beginning, and this gentleman is going to go on after this series of one, two, three, four, five. I don't know. What do you want to call them? You want to call them apneas? You want to call them whipples? What do you want to call them? And what he would say, he would say that the difference between regular breathing and hypopneas and apneas, that is a very thin line. And I think, you know, you, you need to start looking at this. I mean, if you saw the breathing pattern that's on the right for the first oh, 10, 15 seconds throughout the entire period to uh, sleep study, you'd say, oh, this guy's normal. And if you saw it at the end, this guy's normal. But in the middle, of this all these sorts of things are happening. Now, if you start thinking about various things, you say, well, 
this first kind of event, which looks like it might be a mixed apnea, really comes after an arousal of sorts. And so that's a disturbance, S disturbance. And presumably this disturbance is, uh, there's a couple more breaths before that, maybe you know, there's a little upper airway, maybe he had to clear his throat or something, you know, whatever happens during sleep. And they take a little bit bigger breath and then feedback control kicks in and so they don't need to breathe as much. So they go into a central apnea and then they obstruct because central apnea is the airway gets closed. And then look at the response to that, that, that one. It's an over response. What's that called? Well, let's, let's go through it again. You got that, and then it happens again. It goes down, it goes up again, and then it goes down. Then it goes up again, and then it goes down, and then it goes up again, and then it comes down, but then it evens out. So what is that? Talking about like the high loop gain? High loop gain, that's what loop, that's what loop gain is. So somewhere along the line, some little transient disturbance, and this is really kind of like this is a crux because, you know, Magni was saying if it takes this little bit to set off one, two, three, four apneas, five apneas in a row that we would call apneas and everybody would score it and be very satisfied, maybe argue about whether they're mixed or they're hypopneas or they're really apneas or maybe they're reros or, you know, all the things that you would argue about. But he would say, before that, he was breathing pretty well, and all of a sudden got into this. That means it might be easy to treat this guy if you knew what that was. So that's really where all this stuff is coming from. So maybe, you know, this is what uh, Denise is saying. Well, maybe if their muscle tone was just a little bit better, right? And then the other end of this thing, the last apnea, the last event, you see, you see the damping down of the system. He goes into a low loop gain because there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven breaths, a big, almost a big abdominal or rib cage motion. And then it goes up a little bit, comes back down and settles in again pretty nicely. So he dampens his loop gain at the end. So it's all there. It's all there. So when you're looking at these records and you're looking for regularity and you're looking around, you go, huh. That's interesting. And when you're sitting there seeing regular breathing, you go, wow, is it that great? How would you design that? And a person who also, also speaks, also eats, also breathes, also spits through their upper airway. It's pretty interesting. Okay. All right, so that's a recording. We've seen that before. Okay. Burden of untreated sleep apnea. This slide didn't come out very well, but you know, so these are the outcome, right? Control, severe, moderate, OSA treated, control, AHI less than 15. This is the data and I don't have a re I, the reference didn't get mapped onto there, but that's why follow-up in months of people that were probably around 60, 65, so you're in a mortality phase of your life. So you have causes, which are the apneas, causes which are the, the anatomy, uh, arousals, hypoxemia. You have uh, this hypoxemia, and the hypoxemia is really what is there with the uh, with the heart rate changes. You've got, uh, I wanna just talk about, so so now, uh, and we're gonna stop in a second. We're gonna, imagine now you're gonna find a gene for this disease. And I, you know, I got sucked in by it, uh, but I didn't get sucked into humans, because I, uh, fortunately. 
the people who are sucked into humans are still sucked into humans. They're up to 25,000 individuals and they really haven't found much. And why? Because all the genes are down there and all the recurrent apneas are on the top of this. And in order for a gene to fight through to have an apnea hypopnea uh, event, or be able to measure P-crit, or be able to measure loop gain, or be able to measure sleep onset, or be able to do that in sleep and respiratory control, you have to have thousands and thousands of people and the signal is gonna be very small because it's a complex disease. What is a complex disease? It's no one gene and no one physiologic factor determines the entirety of this disorder. So that, you know, I, I, when I'm, I'm pushing Moshi to kind of make a table about genes and genetic under, underpinnings and things of that sort, but really it's, it's gonna be easier to find a gene that um, that does something obvious when you're in pediatrics because you, you're closer to where the gene kind of has its effect and you can look at the craniofacial stuff and you can look at that stuff and kind of get an idea. It doesn't mean that loop gain and those things are not there, but even in obesity, people who are obese, of which now there are 78 genes that produce o obesity, there's still about 15% of people that don't have sleep apnea. So the inheritance is true. Twin studies are 50% concordance. The probability of finding another family member with a high HI, if you have one member is 1.52, it's about 2.5. Three More than three, it's about 3.5. So the odds ratio increases and there are various things in Caucasians and African-Americans. So, but the thing is, is that finding a high AHI in a family means that you just line up all those genes in that family, as well as you line up all their eating habits, as well as you line up all their sleeping habits, and you line up all their other sorts of socioeconomic status, and you end up with having some sleep out. One of the interest clinical recognition that is, anatomy, symptoms, consequences are not causal. You've got to have, you got genes that give, make you increase and genes that make you decrease. And the piece, people who have tried to get estimates of shared genetic variance, this is Patel's work for BMI and AHI, find that, sure, there's an overlap, but, uh, but AHI is not just explained by obesity. In fact, about 50% of sleep apnea is not explained by obesity. And there was no correlation in this, which was Caucasians and African-Americans to craniofacial traits as measured, which were pretty crude. Not inside the mouth though, Denise, not inside the pharynx, not, not and, and Denise and I both wanna be able to measure hypoglossal motor nucleus activity with single motor unit to a to a intracellular uh, level so we can get ESP, uh, ESPSs and, and, and ISPSs in the human brainstem. But we won't do that this week. Not just hypoglossal, man. I want to go for the I know. It's ambiguous, man. Yeah, so, so there's certain things you can't do in people. All right. So the risk factors are often we talk about, we say, well, Caucasian, he's obese, he's drives the upper airway, sleep, arousals, ventilatory threshold. We try to measure gene one, gene two, gene three. We get malampati, we get all sorts of things that we do. And those are all risk factors. Here's the phenotypes. We've talked about this. Anatomy, loop gain, gain in reflex, and, and arousal threshold. Phenotype traits, small collapsible airway, you collapse. Loop gain, you breathe in between. Pharyngeal muscle response, how do you, how do you, how do you recruit it? And then arousals from sleep. And they're all there. So that's where, that's why, you know, so that's, you say, well, what are you, what are you thinking about it? Well, it's incremental over a lot of time, but this is how I think, and this is why I think. This is probably, this is the origins of why I think the way I think. Okay, there you go.